Welcome back to The Extract. I'm Kyle Meyer, and next to me is the irrepressible Jeb Dunnick. Is it time to drink yet? Yes. It's always time to drink. Isn't that, there's only one answer to that, right? There's only one. <laughs> Jeb, hello. Welcome, dude. Thank and you, you, can drink, you can drink more, by the way. I just poured a little bit, but it's like fucking game on. God, so you're such a stingy pourer, man. Dude, it's, 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 it's Tristan, my partner gives me shit about that, so <laughs> it's real. It's it's true. Like, I've got this paranoia. So, like, everybody has a like favorite level they pour to, or they're yeah. tasting people are like, oh, I'm like, hey, you can just keep. keep okay, I got this paranoia. Yeah, get go posed, ahead, you know. So it's, 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 being the wine business, is worried about getting drunk. Kind of weird, huh? So anyway, Jeb Dunnick next to me. If you live under a rock, you haven't heard of him. If you live on top of a rock, or if you live near really big rocks like he does then you have heard of Jeb Dunnick, who has uh, vaulted to popularity in the world of wine criticism in a very short period of time. It's a, a meteoric rise in the world of wine critiquing. You should take up wine writing. <laughs> you, have, you have the adjectives, my I friend. Got, no, I got the source in here. The, um, no, but seriously, you know, uh, we were following Jeb from the early days of Rome Report. That's right. And, uh, and, and checking out his verbiage and seeing what he did. And... Um, and we personally, you know, because I'm a retailer, I'm not wearing my retailer shirt right now, but I'm a wine retailer. Dude, you're missing the I'm time. Not, no, 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 don't worry about it. The, um, but anyway, thanks. But here's the deal. Early on, you find out the cats that actually, you know, I'm not going to say that people don't have integrity in this business, but okay, I'll say it. A lot of people don't have integrity in this business. So the thing is, you start reading people and you learn people that actually give two shits about the wines they're tasting. They're passionate. They're into it. They legitimately like the wines, and they express themselves that way on paper. And that, my friend, is what you do. Cheers to that. And that's why you're in the hot fucking seat right now. So, um, but what I want to get to, Jeb, today with you is, and actually, we feel the questions like this before, because we get asked. Because, for example, I taste five, 6,000 wines a year in what I do, right? Yep, you yep. taste more than that. Um, so the deal is, we're going to ask you a few basic questions today about how the hell do you, be, how, how the hell do you live the life of a wine critic? All right? I'm ready. couple basic Q&A things right yes. here, just to get it started. First of all, how many wines do you taste in a day? Uh, always varies. Right? Yeah. How Good many point. wines can you taste in a day? A lot. A lot. Yeah. How, what's the training involved with going through tasting a large amount of wines in a set period of time? You know, I really don't. It's tough because I swear, I remember like the first day when I did 30 wines a day. And I was like, wow, that's a record. I've never done 30 wines a day. And then I remember the day when I'm like, oh, man, I tasted 80 wines a day. And then it just goes up from there. And so the reality is, is that tasting wine, it's more mental fatigue than palate fatigue. There's no mm -hmm. doubt you do have palate fatigue, but you can manage. If yeah. you do it enough and you know how to taste intelligently, you're not tasting the same wine 20 times, mm -hmm. you can taste a large number of wines throughout the day and be precise and spend the exact same focus on every single wine throughout the day. And so that's, that's the goal, is to have a process and a procedure that says, this is how I'm going to taste, and I, I can taste most of the time. The reality mm -hmm. is most of the time of, taste, of tasting a wine is actually documenting your thoughts. Well, yeah. Well, so that, question number two. Okay. When you actually, you're writing real time. Are you writing real time? And then going back, you know, when you're writing the taste yeah, notes. Yeah. Is it like a 60% type thing? It you're all going, depends on how much time I have. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. So if I'm at a tasting and I have 60 wines to go through in a morning and I'm with an importer, mm -hmm. I'm not going to write a full note. Yeah. Because I feel like I'm, I'm taking their time. Uh, I want to be as efficient as possible, and I want it to be a good time for, for everyone. So I mm -hmm. take a, a shorthand note in that case, and I mm -hmm. always work on a computer, mm -hmm. uh, and so you'll taste a wine, I'll write a very short note, and then I have to go back home, and I may, for you know, half a day tasting, I may spend a day and a half finalizing that. Right, and so okay. it's always a, a trade-off. So if I take the time to write a full publishable note, it takes me about 35% longer for each wine. Got it, okay. Yet I, I still come out ahead because I don't have to spend 50% more time when I go back home right, to, right. to write a full publishable note. Got it, so got it. Cool. Next question from our readers. What got you into this? Uh, love of wine, back. unquestionably. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I always loved wine. So I did, uh, I grew up on a farm. I grew up in Indiana. I drank milk on the table. We had no wine, no, no alcohol at all. <laughs> Milk was a bad choice. So, but I did work abroad in 1996, and I lived in London, and then we traveled through France, and I kind of fell in love with this idea of France and European culture. Mm -hmm. And then when outside of college, I moved to upstate New York, and I used to drive from, I lived in Binghamton, and I would drive to the Gunks to go rock climbing. I used to pass this tiny little hole-in-the-wall wine shop out, and I would stop there. It was all by myself, and they had like, 1990 Bordeaux on there and other things and so I just bought a bottle here or there and so that right. was kind of the, the genesis of it and that 
that continued. I mean, I remember when I used to hide 30 bucks a week from my wife. <laughs> so I would go on Friday and I could buy a bottle of wine, you know, so I could, you know, that was what I would do. Where'd uh, you get this? <laughs> Friend yeah. gave it to me. Russian paratroopers. Yeah, yeah. So I had my little, I had, we rented a house there to have my little cellar under the stairs. And uh, we traveled. Tra I continued to travel. We moved to Colorado. Um, and that was the, the heyday of kind of the wine, the bulletin board and the on, online and, mm -hmm. and Squires board. And so I was heavily involved right. there. I took notes. We traveled through all the wine regions I could. Um, and then early in the 2000s, I took a job at Applejack, mm -hmm. which is a high volume wine store. Yep. And it was this huge shock. But wait, you still had a day job, right? Oh, yeah. So I, I'm an engineer by training. I worked yeah, in aerospace for, you're a rocket for, scientist. for 20 years. Yeah. So I wrote software for satellites is kind of what, that's what I did. Right. And so so I took, so in the evening, so I worked on Monday from like 6 to 11, on Wednesday, 6 to 11, all day and Saturday. And I kind of did that at Applejack's just, just to learn something else about the, the industry. Your wife loved that. Yeah, she was thrilled. She like, <laughs> loved that. That was Go Jeb. <laughs> go Jeb. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're a rock star, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're still married, huh? But so it was such an interesting experience because when you go from being focused on online and thinking you know a lot about wine mm -hmm. to working in a high volume wine store, and I remember somebody says, "Hey, I need a dry reason." I'm like, Shit, "What? Where?" You know, yeah. I didn't, it was amazing what you didn't know, and so it was great to have the experience to a, a wider range of wines, and also to the general wine drinking consumer to say, right. "Hey, how does how do most people approach?" Right. And I would work. You know, I would work for four hours or five hours, and I would get my little paycheck, and I would take home a bottle of wine, and I was bleeding money. I was losing money for this job. You know, so I'm like, you know, it was a funny experience. Uh, and so I did that for a little less than a year, and then in 2008, mm -hmm. I had my Tracy left. I had like a spare day or something. Like, hey, I'm gonna I'll create a website. I had all these notes, and uh, so I created I www.theronreport.com. And uh, did a WordPress and, and built it and did it all myself. I created an SQL database, so I had all everything in Excel. Um, went from Seller Tracker to Excel and then into my SQL database. Man, that was the, that was the start. It kind of started out as, as a blog. I used to do little blogs, and then I quickly decided that it, I hated the blog culture and just couldn't stand yeah. it at all. Uh, so I said, "Fuck that! I'm gonna do. I'll do a publication." Yeah. And so I started doing this. You know, every three months I would do a PDF release. Yeah. And so okay. that's what I okay. Would do. So. How did you transition in that scenario, right? Because it's really curious. So you're, you're doing it for fun. All of a sudden, it's like, well, no, it's a Rhone report. So if you have a Rhone report, you need to do reports on like Rhone wines and Correct. a lot of them, not yeah. like 10 friggin' wines. Yeah. So how did you transition to that? Was it was it phone calls to like, you know, the, the gang and Chaffin of the Pop? Was it phone? I mean, did you travel there? Did Absolutely. You, yeah. You do it like, you know, the thing is, there's no secret here. What do you do yeah. is you look on the website, you find their find the domain's website. <laughs> What's the email? Hello, I'm, I'm Jeb Dunnick. I'm going to be working on a report. Could I please taste your wine? And you do it like, like everyone else. There's no right. secret There's here. There's no you secret, yeah. You start out like everyone else. Nobody knows who you are. And so you... No secret handshake. No. I used you know, I monopolize my, my, my wife and myself checking account. I monopolized yeah. every vacation day we had. And so, and that's what I did. So for three years... Still married. Yeah, I know. I know. She's, she's <laughs> fabulous. I, Tracy, she gives more credit. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully she don't, don't watch this, Tracy. <laughs> So, uh, but I would start, so I would work, my wife and I would commute, we lived outside of Boulder, and we would get right. up at like 6.30, and we would commute together, I would drop her off at 7, I would work from 7 to 3, and I would then pick her up, and we would come home, and I would have a normal life from, you know, 4 to around 8, mm. and then I would start at about 8.15, I started writing for the Rome Report, and I worked from 8.15 to 2 a.m., and I did that for, for five years. And so that was the, you know, that was, and it was just at the end, there were days when I would be driving in, yeah. Into, into Boulder, and uh, if I hadn't spit as well as I should have, right? Or if I were just exhausted, I'd be like, why am I doing this to myself? And I had taped, I had purchased a postcard from Chef Neuf de Pop, and I had taped it on my visor. And so I'd pull down my visor, and there was this photo of Chef Neuf, and I was like, that was my motivation. Just to have the opportunity to go back to France, mm -hmm. just to be able to afford to go back to France one more time so I could taste the wine, so I could mm -hmm. visit with, the, with these great people. Mm -hmm. um, had you already been to Chateauneuf in those areas before? Like, yes. was that part of the inspiration for you because you had traveled, you visited the areas? Did you already have maybe a little bit of a rapport with some of the producers before you went in like wholesale? Yeah, right? I, I did. Yeah. I'd been there, yes. Yeah. I'd, done, I'd done a few, handful of trips through there specifically for the wine. Mm -hmm. I went and then I went back over. I, at one point I went over and I, it was really just to buy wine. I took my sister over and I had her take three cases of wine for luggage and I took, we brought 70 <laughs> bottles back of the airline. <laughs> That's me. We'd now like to welcome any travelers with carry-ons that have no chance of fitting in the overhead for compartment. <laughs> oh, 
sounds good. Trying to lug six six <laughs> cases of wine onto the TGV to get that first. Let me tell you, that sucked. Sucked. <laughs> yeah. Those Europeans were like stupid Americans. <laughs> what do you guys do? There's tons of wine here. You don't have to buy I that know, wine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was great. Another dumb question. I just thought of it. Just came up. Actually, not dumb. Um, okay. Actually, this is my question, right? Okay. Because um, when I taste, right? When I'm here tasting at the store, uh, I'll taste, you know, 100 wines in a day, whatever. But some days, I feel better than others. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. Whether it's harmonic convergence, pressure, biodynamic counter, whatever the hell you want to call it. Hey, man, everybody has days. Some so. days are stronger than others, right? Yeah. If you know, and I know, and I read once in an article, actually, I forget which one it was, one of the main wine publications, that the German reviewer actually come in his article about how he had a head cold during his tastings. Oh, uh, that's tough. Yeah. And it was kind of like, dude, okay, how does that work? Like, will you, will you call, like, uncle? Like, if, you, if you're man down... Right? If you're man down, right? If you, if you wake up and you got the friggin' plague. Yeah. Right? Do you make phone calls that day? or Because well, for me, mm-hmm. or do you calibrate? You sit there and go, okay, I'm a little dented. You know what I mean? Like, and and, and it's, a, it's just an honest question, right? Because so, here I kind of go, like I calibrate. Yeah. That's what I do. Well, the thing is, so there are days when you're going to taste a lot of wine. So during yeah. trips, you don't want to be sick. Right. Okay? And so you work hard to, to, to not be sick. Right, <laughs> right. You know, and, and but every you will always have days that are easier and other days that are harder. And mm-hmm. for me, some days, some mornings, man, tasting notes pop out. I mean, I taste yeah. the wine, I feel like, hey, I know the wine, I can write yeah. the note in my in my sleep. And there are other times where I'm like, fuck, I just want to get on and, you know. And so you you have to, that's a job. It's a it's job. It's a job. You know what I mean? Yeah. We, this is not here having fun. This is a, a job, and my job is to taste that wine, to describe it as accurately as I can yeah. from my perspective, so I can help subscribers. Have an idea of what it's going to taste like and right, decide right. if they will like it. Consumers need to think for themselves. Right. They need to like the wines that they like. There's nothing wrong with disagreeing with what I think or something else. So right. my goal is as long as I'm consistent in how I approach it, trying to give guidance, trying to solve a problem. Right. The, the sole goal of my, comp- of my company is to help people find one that they like. Right. And some days, more than others, requires a more intense dialing in. Yeah, yeah. Some days you are just, at the end of the day, you have a headache, but you, hey man, it's a tough job. Guess what? Do a couple it. Advil. Let's get after it. Yeah. yeah. How important is it to have one voice in the world of wine critiquing, right? Yeah. Because we, um, we're now living in a world where there's lots of voices, lots of things. And originally, like with Bob Parker, he was a one voice dude. Right. Right. How is it important? Do, your consum- do, you, do the folks that read your, ar- your articles let you know that having that one voice is important because the, sa- the calibration is a bit easier? Yeah, I think so. I think right now it's, um, I think it's, the consumers can be misled thinking mm-hmm. that uh, any score works. Yeah. And it's very easy for the consumer to walk in and say, oh, this is a score, this is a note, and not think about who it is. I think that a review is always tied to a person. And so it's mm. critical to understand, from my standpoint as a consumer, who gave the note mm. and to have an idea of who is that person. I mean, right. I think that without you know, no in, in isolation from, from anyone, I think is worthless. Yep. And so I think there's a huge benefit between having a, a single person cover the regions that you, that you love. Mm. And so that's what, why I do what I do. That's why right. I created a, a website. And I think there's incredible value in that. The problem with that is you can't cover everything. I mean, I took <laughs> 10,000 10, wines last year. Yeah. And the number one question I get is, why didn't you read this <laughs> wine? You know, it's literally that. So I'm like, and so there's a, there's a breaking point. And there's also <laughs> a breaking point. With, yeah, report. and you can decide how much time you want to spend on. Everything is a trade-off. You want to, right. Do I want to write a, a huge note? Do I want to write a huge producer profile? You know, at what point is it sufficient? What does the consumer want? So you're always trying to, the small business owner, always trying to balance yeah. what I deliver and meeting expectations. And so right. it's, never, it's never easy. And there's many ways, many ways to do it. Right. right. But you, I think it's, a, it's critical to have, at least you have to know your critic. I think right. that's the yeah. most thing. Really important. And the more that they cover that you love, the, the more value they add, I think. Right, right. In the future, with uh, last last question, we're going to cut this pretty soon. Uh, last question: What are you seeing, uh, for example, with global warming right now? Better wines. Better wines, right? <laughs> right. We're are we entering this this halcyon there, era there, of greatness with wine? I mean, how many dogs do you taste now? I taste yeah, yeah, really so many. few dogs. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a dilemma, I think. So, what what global warming I think is is resulted in is. M- Better, especially in France, because they're on the edge of where they things can get ripe. Mm. So if you think about, you know, Chateauneuf used to be at the edge of where you could get Grenache ripe. Mm. Syrah was at the edge where you could get Syrah ripe. I'm sorry, the Northern Rhone was at the edge right. where you could get Syrah ripe. And the same for, for Burgundy. And so as you increase global warming, you get more and more heat. So you're able to get those grapes ripe right. yeah. 
in more years out of a decade. You know, you used to have two or three good vintages a decade. Today, it's six or seven, you know. Yeah. And, but what the ch another change is that you're, we're changing how we think about greatness and, and vintages, though. Mm. A great vintage may not be the hottest and driest anymore. Right. So it used to be, you know, in, in, in the 80s and 90s, hot and dry was great. Yeah. Today, hot and dry, you have to, uh, careful. Right? How hot, how dry. <laughs> right. So some of these cooler, more even years, 2016 in the Northern Rhone, it's very yeah. long, late vintage, beautiful wines. Yeah. Um, so, but in general, I think, you know, global wine at the moment has unquestionably resulted in, in better, a better string and uh, quantity of, it, of great vintages. Yeah. 20 years ago, I'd be like, man, that sucks. I, I yeah. Hardly, I hardly ever have a sucks moment anymore. <sighs> I tell you, it, it's, yeah, as, from a critic, it kind of sucks because everything is good and you're like, damn it, you know? But that's, that's, on one hand, I'm more 82. So. It's definitely a no for me, dog. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. No. Because 82, I don't have to write the note. I just say, I don't like it. <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know, I was talking with another critic about that. Yeah, actually, you know, I was really, as we're going out here, the, I was talking with another critic about that the other day and he's like, he's like, yeah, that's the problem. Everything's, everything's fucking good. Yeah. You know, it kind of does start in high 80s now. It's yeah, like, yeah. So anymore, you know, it's, it's more about the style of the wine. Uh -huh. That type of thing plays a lot more importance than whether I thought a wine was, an, or a, a critic thought a wine was 92 or 94 or some right. stupid, yeah. stupid bullshit, right? So it's, is, it, is it fruity and, and forward? Is it oaky? Is it tannic? I mean, these type of very high-level descriptors, I think, add more value than these flowery descriptors and, and uh, adjectives that, that wine critics like myself are fond of. Here's the reading tasting notes. I'm down with reading tasty notes. <laughs> we actually do read them around here. Get to know your wine critics. Jeb F. and Dunnick. Represent. Yes. Thanks for coming today, dude. My, my pleasure. Always happy to be here. Thank yeah. you for your time. This is a hoot. Cheers. Cheers, buddy.